Hi, I'm Sravish. This is Trust Talks, a series celebrating people and companies that make GRC trusted, accountable, and transparent. Today, I have with me Earl Duby, CISO at Oxium, who I believe is one of the most committed practitioners in the security and privacy world. Earl, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me, Sravish. This is uh, quite an opportunity, so thank you. Earl, to kick things off, one of the things that you and I talked about a couple of weeks ago was why is security and privacy so darn expensive and how do we make it affordable so that everybody can practice it with the highest standards? I'd love to hear your take on what do you think we should do to make this industry much more affordable and democratized for everybody? Yeah, this is a little bit of a mission that I'm on right now. And so... Um... Maybe I'll give you a little bit of background on me, which will help you understand why I'm where I'm at right now. So I, I have been an enterprise security practitioner for a long time. You know, I've worked in some of the largest companies in the country. I've worked for GE. I've worked for uh, Lear Corporation, which is a $20 billion company. I've worked for uh, Synchrony Financial, which is another Fortune 200 uh, financial services company. So I've always worked in this enterprise space. And when you're an enterprise, especially in financial services, you have a very large budget to work with when it comes to security. But, you know, especially my time at Lear, when I was working with GM and Ford and Stellantis, and we were trying to figure out how do we secure the supply chain, it became very clear to us that once you get below, like Lear was a tier one auto supplier, once you get below that tier one level and you start looking at these smaller and mid-sized companies, security isn't you know as readily available there because the budgets aren't really there and even the skill set isn't there. And so we really started to you know run into this challenge of how do you defend the the top end of the supply chain when there is all this vulnerability at the the tail end of the supply chain. And so when I was at at Lear, you know, we we worked together. So it was me, the the CISO for GM, the CISO for Ford, and the CISO for Stellantis, and we were putting together um, ideas about how do we help push this security down the supply chain, or even how do we even raise awareness that there is a security problem that they need to be addressing? Because a lot of it is they don't even know what the risk is because they don't have that person on board that's telling them about those risks and they're just uh, you know, worried about other problems that are more operational. And so we got together, we put together a supplier awareness day uh, and we put on, you know, my time at Lear, we put on like uh, three of these every October. And it was, it was a free day of virtual training and we invited thousands of uh, suppliers for those four automotive companies to this event and we we got a pretty good turnout of people that were willing to come to the table and learn about the risk and then you know what are some cost effective ways of dealing with that risk and so that to answer your question so that, that's kind of a long way to get to to your question of you know how do we start to make this more affordable to the smaller businesses that are in our supply chains because every supply chain has them and you know we need to do a better job of, of doing this and i think there's a couple ways of you know a couple tools in the toolbox that we have to kind of dig into here you know one is we got to set requirements you know so one of the things that you know i i do see happening more and more and it, i'm actually happy to see it is you know, through the third party risk assessment processes that a lot of these bigger companies are, are doing, you know, they're pushing those requirements further down to their third and fourth party suppliers. And that's raising that awareness. And it's, it's kind of upping the game for some of those mid-sized companies. So that sets up the awareness piece, but that doesn't address the affordability piece. So the affordability piece is really, I think, where the challenge is at for the entire community of how do we spread resources around so that we can get the right tooling to the to the people that need it. And I think, you know, 
this is really where you know some hard lines are going to have to get drawn here about you know it's it's almost like a security welfare system or something along those lines where you have to say like if i'm if i'm the top of the supply chain so whether you're the oem of an automotive you know supply chain or your you know the 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 general mills or the uh, catalogs of the food chain or whatever there there's a there's a risk there that you may have to compensate for and i don't know how this is going to work you know so this is just ideas being thrown around at this point but somehow we're going to have to get to this point of saying there's value to the top of that supply chain for there to be security at the tail end of that supply chain so how do you how do you do that do you develop a consortium and you know have multiple companies fund it and allow you know companies further down the supply chain to draw from that or do and I, and I know GM did this when when I was at Lear is they signed up for a third party risk assessment tool I think it was uh, maybe it was can't remember the name of it but you know it's one of those third party tools that look at your external posture and let you know if you have you know open ports and things like that and they bought a, an enterprise license to that tool set and then modified the agreement to the point where they could offer it to their suppliers so then i could use the gm licensing model to to get that tool and so maybe that's something that we have to think about you know when you look at the you know the fortune 150 companies of maybe they start buying licenses and providing some of that access to their suppliers so that we can make some of that cheaper further down there and then the third third leg to that stool to me is just the the skills the skill training and again this is where i think that the bigger companies have something to offer to the smaller companies of saying hey look if you have a security practitioner maybe there's just one in your organization and maybe they're feeling a little overwhelmed or they're feeling a, a little bit under trained let them go do some mentoring with you know skilled people from these other companies so if maybe gm offers to uh you know one of those smaller tier two or tier three type suppliers to have like virtual mentoring sessions or virtual training sessions with those people so that they can learn those skill sets so i think you know if you if we address the requirements we make the tooling more affordable and we start spreading that training around you know free free training we can start to you know push those uh those those talents and those skills further down the supply chain which ultimately helps out the entire community that's involved yeah, I think that's amazing innovation that you're talking about, uh, Earl, because uh, as you were speaking, one of the things that I remembered was Amazon Web Services and so does Azure and GCP. They actually go to their startups uh, that use their cloud products and they offer free services such as foundational technical reviews and security reviews where they pay for an external consultant to come in and look at your architecture on these clouds and tell you, if there are any gaps in how you've implemented your product to use these clouds. And I think there's an opportunity to create a business model where buyers of software can provide access to uh, consultants like this who can come and do a security review and an architecture review, not from the perspective of telling you um, where all your gaps are, but rather to in, in, from the perspective of helping you get better. Uh, and if mm -hmm. and if we can operationalize that and make that more affordable and create a business model around it, then it helps the whole community at large. Yeah, well, I, I like what AWS is doing and Azure does it as well is, you know, there's a ton of free content out there that they make available in terms of, you know, security training, architectural training, uh, feature training. So there, there's a lot out there that they provide for free. And I've actually gone through a, some of the AWS training and that and that's valuable training because a lot of the the risk that comes further down the supply chain is coming from cloud you know it's a cloud risk that they're taking on because they're 
migrating off-prem into a cloud service, um, you know, software as a service and things like that, and they don't have the skill set to necessarily configure that stuff correctly, which then exposes all that data, those secrets, you know, to adversaries. And, and that's where, you know, when you think about like Ford or GM, you know, and that's just kind of the, the, the frame that I look at a lot of things because I spent so much time in automotive. But when you look at those OEMs, they're sharing a lot of data with their suppliers. Yeah. You know, that's how you get a third party piece that fits into a Ford Ranger is they have to share yeah. those specs, you know, way down that supply chain to make that stuff work. And so there's a lot of secrets that are setting in these smaller companies. And in a lot of cases, you know, they may understand that they have that risk that they're holding onto that data, but they may not understand what the attack vectors are to that data, meaning yeah. they might not understand that they have a cloud, you know, security gap that is exposing that data. And so, you know, when you look at those free services from AWS, and if you can start to wrap around, you, you know, more awareness, which is another, you know, I'm involved with the Cloud Security Alliance and I'm the uh, Detroit chapter president of the Cloud Security Alliance. And part of what we're trying to do is to raise the level of awareness with executives that it, just because you move to the cloud doesn't mean that you've mitigated your risk. You've just changed your risk. So now maybe instead of having the risk of a unpatched server in a you know unprotected storage room in your facility, now you've moved that risk up to the cloud and you don't offload all that risk when you go to the cloud. You exchange some risk for other risk. And part of that is, do you have a skilled workforce that understands how to properly configure those cloud resources? And so, you know, having those free resources out there and raising that awareness is pretty critical when you start making these digital transformations. Earl, you mentioned about communicating your security posture with executives. What would be your practical advice for other CISOs or people that are, that are growing in their careers on how to communicate the impact of their security investments to the executive teams as well as to the board of directors? Well, I, th I think it, to me, the, the problem isn't so much how CISOs are communicating to their executives. What I'm really focused on and why I'm at Oxium, so Oxium is an MSP. And so, you know, th there's a couple of things that I'm trying to do by joining an MSP. You know, one is I want to dispel this myth that if you're a CISO at an MSP, you're not a CISO, you're a salesperson, which is totally not true. You're a CISO and a salesperson. You know, you still have to protect all of your clients and your own company from all the same risks that any other CISO is protecting their client from. You know, now instead of having, you know, a client with one logo over top of it, I have multiple clients with multiple logos, multiple different security postures, multiple different uh, maturity levels. And so the challenge is actually more difficult to be a CISO at an MSP than you know, what people really give it credit to. So I, I have to constantly be kind of dispelling this myth that now all of a sudden I'm a salesperson and not a security practitioner, which is incorrect. So when, when you, so that's thing number one. Thing number two is, you know, as a, as a CISO at a MSP, the, the challenge becomes how do you take people that have maybe never even thought about security and ease them into the concept of this risk that they're setting on that they may not even be aware of? Because typically when you're part of an MSP, you're not out directly interacting with the CEOs of these companies. That, that's being brought in through your other services that are being provided to them, whether it's infrastructure support or network support. And then we're offering this uh, additional security service on top of that. So, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to CEOs and managing partners of companies that have never really had to think about the security risk. And now we're presenting that to them. And so, you know, you really have to go back to a very basic level of, you know, 
what is this risk and why is it important to you? So I, I think to answer your question, you know, when you have a CISO, you already have a company that is aware that they have a security problem. You, they wouldn't have a CISO if they weren't aware of the risk. So when you have the title CISO, you already know that you're working within a company that has some level of maturity. Now they might not appreciate the full level of their risk, or they might not appreciate the full extent of what has to be done to mitigate that risk, but they at least understand and they at least have some governing body over top of them, whether it's a board of directors or whatever, that says, hey, this security thing is important and we have to do yeah. something about it. When you get into a company that doesn't have a CISO, that's where the communication is you know, much more important because now you have to take them from at some point, maybe zero, to you know wherever they're at and you gotta you gotta meet them where they're at and then try to guide them through there without that um, you know that lexicon being there you know that, that all the things that are there when you have you know the structure in place that a CISO is working with and how do you um, one of the challenges CISOs have Earl is that they're always inundated with tons of security products. Have you encountered any security product or privacy related product in the recent past that you've looked at and said, wow, that's really innovative. That product is doing something interesting, special, unique, and is truly helping the industry in a big way. Yeah, I know it's, I know it's probably like an overplayed thing, but you know, when CrowdStrike came along, you know, that to, to me, that was a bit of a game changer because, you know, up until that point, we had been dealing with endpoint protection that was very signature based and very database heavy. And, you know, the clients just kept growing and growing as you started putting all that, you know, historical data in there. And, you know, th then CrowdStrike comes along and says, hey, look, we're going to keep everything up in the cloud so that we can keep a very light footprint on the devices. And we're not looking for signatures anymore. We're looking for behaviors. You know, that, that was awesome. You know, and so when we, when we switched off of our old antivirus product onto CrowdStrike and then just saw the, the amount of things that it was finding that our previous product was setting on for years and didn't find, it was, it was pretty eye-opening to, to see how that actually worked and see it in action like that. So that's, that's probably the, you know, the product that I'm most amazed with at the time that we made that transition. And, you know, and I'm still, you know, amazed with it even, you know, years later that, you know, that really has transformed the way that endpoint worked. You know, now we have other companies coming along, you know, that are mimicking that behavior-based model. But I, I think as you see this infusion of artificial intelligence and machine learning into these security products, it's, uh, it, it really makes you see this divide between the old school, which was you know, really just heavily based on you know, reactive mode versus now you can get to this point of being proactive and you know, isolating individual nodes off and not having to shut entire you know, VLANs down and things like that. I think it's um, it's really changed the way that blue teaming kind of works now because they have a much better tool set. Yeah, one of the things yeah. I always hear from CISOs is that don't just tell me where the smoke alarms are going off. Tell me where the fire is that I need to work on right now. And that allows them to be more proactive and focus on yeah. the more important things versus just being reactive every time a smoke alarm goes off because the battery is weak. And needs to be changed. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, and, and on, not, on another set of products, you know, I'm spending a lot more time now doing assessments and, uh, you know, things like that, that didn't used to happen before, because like I was talking about a little bit earlier, when you're trying to explain this world of security and privacy to people that really aren't trained in that line of thinking. And so you, you're really starting from zero and trying to work that maturity level up you really rely a lot more heavily on assessments and things like that to kind of yeah. tell the story. And so, you know, when, when you're trying to do that, 
in the old days, you would take a spreadsheet and you would say like, hey, you know, here's the NIST cybersecurity framework or here's the CIS 20, now the 18, and you would just start filling in this spreadsheet and you would show people like, hey, look, this spreadsheet, you have all these gaps and things like that. You know, now with these new tools that are out there around GRC, it, it, it becomes much easier, you know, and, and it's interesting to watch this world evolve because like we're right in the middle of the evolution of these GRC tools when it comes to assessments. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty amazed at how, you know, they don't just track your answers so that you can reuse, you know, some of the controls across multiple frameworks. They're actually, you know, hooking into your systems so that it's pulling your password policies right from the source system as opposed to, you know, someone having to log in, take screenshots of the, you know, of the console and things like that and upload that as evidence. It's like, no, you're, you're actually pulling this evidence directly from the source systems, putting that into a, uh, you know, into a database and then allowing multiple frameworks to reference that evidence as, you know, proof of compliance. And so I think, you know, that's also going to be, you know, a game changer as we move ahead so that we can, you know, just speed up the process of assessing where our gaps are at and then, you know, reducing the cost. If you're, if, say, if you're going for multiple certifications, you want to get an ISO certification, you want to get a SOC 2 certification, you know, instead of collecting evidence twice, you know, you can just collect the evidence once, put it into a database, overlay the frameworks, and then, you can see where there's multiple controls that have been answered. And then, then you only have to focus on the things that are outside of that. That's going to be, you know, a tremendous workload relief for usually the one person in some of these organizations that have to go do all that work. Earl, one of the things you've told me you're very passionate about is mentoring. Uh, you help lots of people in the community improve their skill set. Who has inspired you? Uh, as somebody who gives back, somebody who's innovating, somebody who's a custodian of trust and is trying to elevate this practice of security, privacy, and GRC into more a trust-based mechanism. Who is a trust champion in your mind? Yeah, so when I when I first took over the role at, uh, at Lear, so I was coming from Synchrony Financial and I was taking over the role at at Lear and I was the head of security at Lear. It wasn't a CISO at that point. It was a, <laughs> it was a senior manager of information security. And, you know, so I was, I was looking around the community and I ran into these two guys that have kind of shaped the way that I do the work that I do. And they really helped me on this journey of progressing from the senior manager of information security into the director of information security, and then ultimately to the VP and CISO at Lear before I left there. And, um, you know, those two guys, one was John Bingham. He was the uh, CISO at Stellantis. And the other was Martin Bally, who was the CISO at uh, ZF at the time. And then he uh, shortly thereafter went to uh, Diebold. So those two guys kind of took me under their wing and, you know, were, were explaining to me like, you know, here's, here's how you got to elevate the conversation. Here's how you have to, you know, build teams out. Here's, here's the types of things that you have to do to move this position from a senior manager position, which is a really a, you know, a practitioner type of a position to a CISO, which is more of an executive level position. And so those two guys, you know, they, they really helped me out and uh, showed me a lot of the ropes that I needed and ultimately helped me grow that position to where it needed to be. Martin, John, if you're hearing this, thank you so much for taking Earl under your wing and he's now giving back and paying it forward with the next generation of security professionals, it's, which is fantastic to see. Yeah, yeah, I owe a lot to those guys and I still talk to them regularly. Earl, thank you so much for joining me today on Trust Talks. I really appreciate your help and the community thanks you for everything that you're doing, not only in the greater Detroit area, but for the security community at large. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for the opportunity and 
like you said, I like to give back, and I think we all should like to give back because, you know, when you go down the path, the people behind us are the ones that are going to be protecting us in the future. So, you know, we, we got to get them a good solid foundation, a good ethical foundation. And uh, that only happens if people reach out and give their time to the next generation of leaders that are coming up behind them. Thank you, Earl. All right, thanks.